My name is Ezra Serens. I'm a rising junior at Michigan State University. And today I'm here to talk to you all about paperless debate on a PC system. Um, there are a few things that I want to show you before we get started. Uh, the primary one is that if you go to the SDI website and you scroll down to the same place where you found uh, Maggie Review's lecture notes yesterday from her topic lecture, you will also find a series of basically a resource packet that relates to this lecture uh, that I recommend that you pull up so that you will be able to find some of the website links that I am going to go through throughout this lecture. So if you scroll down 2019, you go to, le to uh, 2019 lectures, you click there, and then you see paperless lecture, and then my name, and then you click notes outline. There is kind of a set of links here. No. What? <laughs> Ignore that. But here you will see a set of links available. I recommend taking a look at these uh, at various points. I'll explain over the course of the lecture what the ones that are relevant for Windows actually are. And then um, if you need to pull them up after the fact, you will be able to. Um, there will be a lot of parts of this lecture that some of you already know what is going on. There will also be parts of it that some of you will be like, there is no way I can get my computer to work for this. What the point of this is, is to demonstrate our best practices and our tips and tricks for using your computer most effectively. Every computer is different and will have its own technical difficulties. So um, don't stress out if your computer is not working at this moment or if something that I'm trying to demonstrate to you, you can't emulate on your computer. Just take notes on it and try it again later. If you are having a technical difficulty that is specific to your computer, um, you can ask Robbie, who is the one of the night office staff and is also the tech help person. He goes on to work at the uh, SDI office, which is on the third floor of the Armstrong door, uh, at 5 p.m. So basically show up as soon as your dinner starts or after your dinner, after you're checked in the door, and he will be able to help you with any you-specific technology problem. Um, there will be a time period for questions at the end. I ask that those questions are not like, Ezra, my computer does not work, and our questions like, how would I do this more effectively, that would have more portable and generalizable benefit for the larger group. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. Um, all right, then let us start with installing verbatim. How many of you already have verbatim installed on your computer? Awesome. I'm going to very briefly demo installing verbatim for those of you that do not already have verbatim installed on your computer. In order to use Verbatim, you will need access to Microsoft Word. There are a lot of ways to get access to Microsoft Word. The main two are that you will either need to pay for it yourself, um, or a lot of schools are starting to provide access because it's a necessary educational tool. So for example, when I was in high school, I had like a school email and a school password, and that gave me access to Word. But um, you're going to have to check with like your school district or your school in order to figure out if that's an option that is actually going to be available to you. I think that even if you would have to pay for it yourself, obviously everyone's situation is different, but generally Word is a worthwhile investment for people because it comes with a suite of other resources uh, that are incredibly helpful and necessary in academic and professional environments. Investing now in getting a Microsoft Office license will pay dividends for the rest of your life functionally in the new modern capitalist society in which we live. Um, so in order to install verbatim, you go to paperlessdebate.com slash verbatim, which is one of the links that has been provided in the resource packet. You select download for Windows. It's going to think for a second. I would like to save the file. Then I open the file. It is going to eventually load. I'm going to agree to the terms. I'm going to install it. Yay. So then if you click in order to see your desktop, you will notice that there is now a link called verbatim. Click to open that. This will open the verbatim template. And then it will go to the configuration guide. Click next. I would recommend keeping all of the options on step one on their default. I've never had a need to change any of these. I would select that you were in high school. 
I would skip the tab room and Gmail accounts page. These are like very next level features that I don't use um, because I frankly find them clunky. I have talked to people who've used them in the past. Some people find them useful, not a lot of people find them useful, and a lot of people just prefer manually using email chains or manually updating their wiki, uh, both of which are things that I will show you how to do over the course of this lecture. Uh, most of you, unless you know otherwise, do not have a pad site, so click no. Uh, if you do know that you have a pad site, I have no experience using it, so you would want to talk to your coaching staff that does know about using a pad site. Um, this is about updating the wiki which I don't recommend doing through the integrated verbatim function. I've done it before. It's possible, but not. Uh, it's not easier than just updating it manually. So I would recommend just not doing anything on this page. And then we are not going to launch the verbatim tutorial because I am your in-person verbatim tutorial. Um, but now we have verbatim. A couple of things that are important about verbatim. The first is that it is a universalizable template across the debate community for looking at debate evidence. So one thing that annoys people when we look at evidence is that we all have preferences for how it is that we like our evidence to look. We want it to be in a certain font. We want things that are underlined to look a certain way. We want citations to look a certain way. Everyone's preference is different, and while we could sit here and argue about whose, whose preferences are best, the good thing about the verbatim template is that it allows it to be loaded in whatever your preference is. So, for example, on my template that you can see like on my screen, you can't see, but it loads in Times New Roman because that is my preferred font. I'm sure that some of you think that I am like a crazy person who is bent on destroying all things that you love and hold dear. Um, I don't care. And because of the magic of verbatim, I don't have to care. Because you can set in the settings pane of verbatim what font you want to use. So if you go to verbatim settings and format, you could, for example, instead of using this disgusting font, <laughs> set it to Times New Roman and hit save. And now it's beautiful. Similarly, because of that, there is a habit that some of you have. Uh, this is also, this lecture is going to include embedded throughout a couple of things that annoy Ezra that I'm going to tell you not to do. One of them is that whenever you are working on a verbatim document, you should never attempt to override the font as it appears in the document, because then you are going to make that choice for everyone who loads that document in the future, which is bad and annoys them. So instead, just use the default verbatim template and kind of just let that do its thing it will work itself out. You will be able to see it in the font that you want. Other people will also get to see it in the font that they want. Over time, you will change around your verbatim <coughs> settings and make it the way that you specifically want it. Uh, there are a couple of them that I want to show you here right now. Uh, you can put in your personal info and your words per minute. Um, the words per minute calculator is a mechanism to determine how long a given speech is. So for example, some people use it in order to time their 1 in C's to make sure that they're going to fit in 8 minutes because you don't read the same thing in every 1 in C. In order to do that, you would need a rough estimation of exactly how fast you are. The times that are listed here are dramatically inaccurate, and I don't just say that because I'm slow, although I am ridiculously slow. Um, the maximum for most debaters is about 310 words per minute. If you're getting above that, you are like fast, fast, and if you are getting like around 200-ish, you are still reasonably fast, even by debate standards. But having an accurate words per minute count and putting it in there allows you to, whenever you load a document, use the stats function that appears right here in order to determine how long it will take you to read the document. Under the paperless tab in the settings, there are two things that I want to show you. The first is that you can autosave things. What autosave does is that whenever you generate a new speech document, which is like a verbatim term of art, which I will define in a moment, um, you can set the directory to where it will save. So for example, what a lot of people do is that they set this to be somewhere on their Dropbox that they share with their partner, so that if I were to create a document that is my speech document, like say it was like 2 in C round 4 or whatever, it would be shared in a folder that my partner also has access to uh, should they need to load it over the course of uh, the debate. 
Similarly, it would also be there whenever I go back later and I'm like, hey, I want to go find my 2 and C that I gave round 4 of this tournament. I would know where that 2 and C is and I would be able to pull it up. Another thing is audio recordings. Um, not everyone is taking active <coughs> audio recordings. It's a good tool to help you improve. And verbatim has an inbuilt function in order to record audio. It's right here, right above the stats button is the record button. When you click it, it starts a recording. When you click it again, it stops a recording. And you can set a predetermined folder where all of those audio recordings will go. Uh, a lot of people set this on their desktop. Other people set it also in a shared folder with their partner. It's really up to you. I do remind you that if you want to record others, you should ask for their consent before you do so. However, you are free to record yourself at any time, and it's a good tool for self-improvement, which is why it's been integrated into the verbatim template. Format. There are a lot of things here. Um, you can set this however it is that you prefer. So, for example, some of the preferences that I have um, are that I like when things are underlined. I like it to be bolded and underlined. And I like when things are emphasized for there to be a box around it. Some of you think I'm crazy. What it really just means is that I'm old because this is how it used to be. And I'm getting old and that is a crazy realization for me in debate. Um, but alas, we are here. Also, for example, I prefer narrow spacing over wide spacing. Uh, which you all may not understand fully what I mean by that right now. But these are all settings that are just like purely cosmetic that you can play with on your own time that I wanted to show you. Next. We will talk about keyboard later. Okay. I want to demonstrate to you what all of the function keys do in the context of making a document so that you can get a better feel for what it is that all the function keys do. The function keys are found in the format toolbar, which is on the top of the document. See up here where my cursor is? These keys, each of them has a slightly different function, and I want to demonstrate them all for you. But first, your computer, by default, if you want to use one of these function keys, it assumes that you are referring to what, for the purposes of your computer's operating system, they all do. So for example, on my computer, for the purpose of my operating system, the F6 key does not refer to what I want it to refer to. It refers to fast forwarding whatever song I'm currently listening to. And the F1 key refers to muting whatever song it is that I'm currently listening to. Those are not the things that I actually want those to refer to. But if I wanted to use the F6 key, say, as the block header, which is what I most often, often am using it for, then I would have to hit the function key before I hit F6, which is just like really annoying and time consuming and a lot of time is like wasted there and it like ticks me off. So I want to show you very briefly how to go about fixing that. For some of you, there is an easy keyboard embedded function that will fix it almost instantaneously. For others of you, you will have to do a, a restart of your entire computer, which I'm not going to demonstrate here because I don't want to take the time to restart this entire computer. That would eat up like all of our lecture time. Um, but there is a resource that is available. I put in place, I put one guide to fixing the function keys through uh, the BIOS settings. Um, it involves restarting your computer completely. I would recommend pulling up the guide that I've included in the resource packet. And then also, if that guide isn't getting it done for you or isn't clear enough for you, you can Google it. And there are like a dozen guides that are written on this subject. And at least one of them you will be able to follow through to completion, I am pretty sure. And if you're having difficulties, talk to Robbie. For those of you who have the easy to use function, you will want to hit the function key, which is in the bottom left hand corner of most keyboards. And then you will want to hit the escape key, which is in the top left hand corner of most keyboards. If you hit those two keys simultaneously, it will flip the function keys. What that means is that now, Whenever I want to use a block header, it will do so just by hitting F6 and not by hitting function F6. However, if I say wanted to use F6 for whatever it was originally intended to do on your computer, like let's say it's a volume control, then I will need to hit function F6. Does that distinction make sense to everyone and why it is useful to flip the function keys? I'm happy to re-explain or try to explain in a different way if anyone is confused. Awesome. 
So when we open a file, we can use a variety of different function keys, and I kind of want to briefly demonstrate what a lot of them do. So the first one is the F4 pocket header. Uh, if you go to your keyboard, the function key is on the top row of your keyboard, and you hit F4, you get this beautiful thing. It is like a big box, and I can type anything. Like let's say I'm going to cut, ooh, caps lock's on. I'm going to cut the politics DA. So I will label my F4 politics DA. The F5 header is a slightly smaller header. It looks kind of like this. Let's say the first, I don't want to show you that yet. The first section of my file is going to be the 1 in C. So I will put an F5 header that is labeled 1 in C. You hit the F5 button, this is called a hat. It is labeled in your um, functions pane that is on top of your screen. And you can also access it by just hitting the F5 key. So then I can create a 1 in C. If I hit F6, I get to create what is called a block. A block is kind of like it's kind of like your base unit, if you will, when you are using documents. And I will explain why that is the case in a moment. Um, but it is basically an even smaller header that you use for a unit of arguments. So for example, it would be like politics DA or like debt DA 1 in C. And then this is my header for the debt DA 1 in C. And then I will have like uniqueness, link, internal link, and impact in here. As I'm going, you will see, let's delete this. You will see in the navigation pane, which is found on the left side of your screen, that there is a navigation pane appearing. I realize I used the same word like three times in the sentence. There's a navigation pane appearing in the left side of the screen. You can see that each element of our document hierarchy is appearing there and that they are all collapsible. So for example, if I add a bunch of other headers under 1 in C, and let's say I decided I had this huge file open and I didn't want to see any of that garbage for a moment in my document navigation pane, there is a triangle and I can click it and suddenly it will all go away out of the navigation pane. It is still in your document, you will be able to find it later but you no longer have to look at it at all times, which just declutters your screen and makes it a little bit easier to work. So now the next function I want to show you all is taglines. So for example, each card has a tagline. Let's say our uniqueness card has a tagline. If you hit the F7 key, that will be the tagline. So like uniqueness, debt, deal, works. Then you will have citations, underlining and emphasis, which I will show you in the context of an activity that we will do in a brief moment where we will actually cut a card. Uh, in person, we will recut a card that originally appeared in the packet app that Tyler put together. So when I go over to my flash drive where I have attached the Taiwan app starter packet that you all were given on day one of the camp so that you all can see kind of all of these levels in practice and understand what they are doing and how it is that they were created in the context of a finalized and completed document. So on the left hand side you see the navigation pane. You see the lovely and beautiful note section with a lot of extra words. We are going to scroll past that for a second. You see there's a section, there's an F5 header for plans and then there are like options for the plan text that you could conceivably read. There is a header for the CCP advantage, and there is a 1AC header. And then in here, there is an F7 header, which is the tagline of the first card of the CCP advantage. And then under that, you will see the citation, and you will see the um, card itself, the text of the card. What we are going to do now is we are going to demonstrate in a different document, not this document. But basically, we are going to recut this very first card in the 1AC. Uh, in order so that I can demonstrate in practice how a lot of these tools are used and I will narrate for you what I am doing on my computer keyboard as I'm doing it so that you all can kind of try to learn from that experience. So we are going to recut the card from this article from Sputnik News um, that Trump will sell Taiwan F-16 jets. So I'm going to copy the URL. I'm going to go over here, create a new tab. Whee!
Wow, doesn't that like aircraft look like awesome? Kind of. It's scary too. And we're going through this and we are looking for a car that the F-16 sale will actually go through. Conveniently, when people write articles, they give us little flags for that. For example, there's a section of the article titled Prospect of an F-16 Deal. So I'm going to copy the relevant section of the article. Hit copy. Then I'm going to go over to Word. And I'm going to go over to my document. I'm going to create an F6 header because this is where this card lives, called CCP Advantage Yes F16 Sale. <coughs> and then, big like first mistake I want to point out that a lot of people make whenever they cut a card. For years, we have all been trained to use copy and paste through Control C and Control V, right? Mm -hmm. When you cut cards in verbatim, you should never, ever, ever Control V something. Never, ever, ever control V something. And I will demonstrate very briefly why. Whenever you hit control V, this is what happens. See how this now looks like ugly and not like, <coughs> sorry y'all. Um, but see how it doesn't look anything like what the other text is? Or it looks a little bit like it, but not exactly like it. And then see how there's like this thing here. There's like, like what even is this? Like this is like some like floating box that randomly appeared in like my template that is like not useful for reading and debate and not a card. And then it's like there are all these hyperlinks. So imagine how annoying it is whenever you like open your speech document, you are like in a debate, you want nothing to get in your way or be a problem for you. And then it's like there's just this link and it's like if I accidentally click this link a certain way, it is gonna like open a new web page for me. That is annoying and you don't want that to happen in debate. So instead what we do is that we use the F2 paste key. Whenever you paste into a document to cut a card, you use the F2 paste key. What this does is it means that it is standardized to the formatting of the document where it originally appeared. See how it's nice and there's no hyperlinks and it matches the formatting that I set in the rest of the document? This way it is standardized, all your cards will look similar, and whenever someone else loads the cards, their cards will all look similar in whatever template they have chosen to load it. Does anyone not understand how to use the F2 paste key or why we use the F2 paste key? Good. So then we are going to demonstrate how, okay, so first, sometimes whenever you copy and paste over from an article, it brings over a bunch of like stuff that is not actually a part of the card that you can delete out of it. So for example, it took over the like text that is the like caption for the image like, for example, um, this like Flickr image, apparently, is what Sputnik News uses uh, for its images of an F-16 Viper. We are like, no, we're deleting this. It's not part of the article. And then we're like deleting this other link to a different article they want us to read. The F-3 key is used to condense. There are some times where you should use the F-3 key. There are some times where you should not use the F-3 key. It is most useful to use the F3 key when um, there is a PDF and basically a paragraph does not appear as a paragraph whenever you copy and paste it into Word. This is difficult to demonstrate without uh, a specific example, but there are times where you will need to use it. A time that you should not use it, especially while at the Institute, is that you will have a news article like this one and some people really, really like although I, I strongly disagree with this. They really, really like to condense all of the paragraphs into one long, ugly thing that has like no paragraph breaks. This does not make sense to me because paragraph breaks are a part of how our brain works and reads and they are a part of how the author meant the article to be read. So some people would take this entire block of text, they would like copy it off like this, and then they would hit the F3 condense key, which I will do just for demonstration purposes, and see how this is now an unreadable block of, like, garbage? Like, try to imagine reading this. Like, it does not make sense because your brain likes to have paragraph breaks. It does not like to sit down and read massive walls of text. Some people may disagree with me. And I realize that some squads have a policy to the contrary. This is what I will say for you while you are at Institute. Please do not do this because it makes the choice for everyone who looks at this card in the future that they can only read it in this way. It is functionally impossible to undo what I just did. 
uh, whenever you are not the one who originally cut the card, um, which means that you are then, for the future and for everyone that sees your card in the future, making the choice for them that it is illegible. So do not make that choice for other people, let them make that choice. Does that make sense? Okay. But that is what the F3 condensed function does. I already showed you what F4, F5, F6 do. So now let's write a tagline for our card. We already know what this card says, so F16 sale coming now. I'm not used to this keyboard, so the typing is rough. Then I'm going to show you about underlining cards. There is a feature in verbatim that some of you will be tempted to use that you should never ever use. And I'm going to like, I'm going to shut it down now because otherwise like things are going to get bad. Called auto underline. I am also regretting in case some of you did not know this existed and are now about to use it. The automatically underline card <coughs> function does not work and also means that you do not learn anything while you are cutting a card. What it would do is that it would, I'm not even going to demonstrate it for you. <laughs> it automatically, so you know how when you cut a card, you have to underline it, which we will do manually in a second. This feature will automatically do it, but it will automatically do it very poorly. It only works with like very basic card cutting. It does not work with any higher level card cutting. And it means that as a result, you don't read the full text of your card and you don't learn anything. And you don't think about how to make choices about what you do and do not actually want to read in debate. If some of you are in the habit of using this function, you need to like stop and never ever do it again. And if you have not been in this habit, then forget that I have instructed you about this. Yes? Can we see you do it once? <laughs> that way we don't do it ourselves. Wow, see how poorly that is highlighted? This should be a great example. <laughs> like, like, look at how absurd this is. Like, like, just take a mental note of what the underlining looks like now. We are about to go through and re-underline the card with, like, using our brains. And then you will see how terrible of a job this is. Okay? Okay. F-16 sale coming now. There is the prospect of an F-16 deal. I'm going to use F9 on this. Now some people, there is an additional feature that is called F10. It is for emphasis. So when you're <coughs> underlining a card, sometimes you're just like underlining long sentences and it's like the individual phrases don't matter and it's like who really cares. <coughs> sometimes there are specific words and phrases or parts of the article that you want to call attention to. I am a person who likes to call attention to titles and subtitles that appear in the original article, which this is an example of. This is like a subsection on the fact that there is going to be an F16 deal. So what some people do is they use the F10 emphasis key on those sections of the article, which I'm going to do here. You can set your F10 emphasis key to look like whatever you want. Why is my F10 emphasis key not working? Ah, that is why it is not working. There we go. When you use the F10 emphasis key, it will show up slightly differently. For some of you, your underline key just shows up as underline and not bolded as underline. That is fine is perfectly acceptable, it is a part of how you use verbatim, and is why you should always use the F9 underline key instead of hitting Control plus U to underline. Yes? The F10 key is for added emphasis, which means for some of you it will show up as just underlined and bolded, for some of you it will show up as underlined, bolded, and boxed. That is entirely also a question of personal preference, but you should always use the F10 key and not just bold and underline things. So now, yeah, thank you, Subi. Um, so now we are going to underline the card all the way through. Media reports. Hit the F9 key because I want to highlight those terms. Suggested. Uh, current U.S. administration is striking a deal to supply Taiwan with F-16 jets. Trump's advisors urge Taiwan to submit an official request for new F-16 jets. Blah, 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 uh, blah, 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 with the inauguration of Trump, Washington's policy has changed. Nope. 
as the blah 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 blah. Yeah, I don't care. Huang, who is a military analyst, he's qualified, sees no reason why Congress would prevent Taiwan's request. Okay, we will pretend that's all the relevant parts of the card. But see how even me like fake cutting this card is like so much better than auto underline and like actually includes warrants. For example, it includes a reference to the fact that Congress might have to approve it, which is an argument that Nick could make, and you will now have a card that assumes that argument. And also, like, now we're citing Paul Huang, who is apparently an expert of some kind. Yes? <laughs> okay. Don't use auto underline. Now we're going to highlight our card. You can highlight either using the F11 highlight key, or you can use the, by clicking on the highlight function that is in your toolbar. The prospect of an F-16 deal, media reports, suggested current administration is striking a deal to supply Taiwan with F-16s. Uh, Trump urged Taiwan to submit an official request. With Trump, policy has changed. Underlined. Does everyone understand how underlining, emphasis, and highlighting works? Pop quiz for the group. If I want to underline, should I hit the F9 key or should I hit Control plus U? Somebody raise your hand and answer. In the front row right here. F9 key. Thank you. Why? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Just in case anyone missed it, always hit the F9 key, never hit control underline. Always hit the F9 key, never hit control underline. Thank you all very much. Public service announcement on behalf of all of your lab leaders. Okay. I'm just saying. Then we are going to cite our card if we go back to the original card in the original document. Uh, I am not going to recite it because that would take too much work and time. But for example, you can see Tyler's site that he wrote. He includes the year and the source and date. He includes that it is citing Paul Wong and who that is. And just like you know, isn't he qualified? He's he's legit. It includes the title, how can prospect of Taiwanese F-16 procurement affect US trade talks with China? And the date that the article was published, and the hyperlink to the article. There is a part of the citation that you read in debates, right? You have the tagline when you are reading a card in debate, you're like, tagline, F-16 sale coming now. Sputnik 19. You don't read like Sputnik 19 citing Paul Wong, who is an East Asian columnist for the Epoch Times. You don't read all of that. So the part that you will read out loud, you should use the F-8 citation key. This makes it appear in a distinct format that is like bolded and will stand out to you while you are reading. But, which does not appear in your navigation pane because that is not necessary for you to see in your navigation pane. Does that make sense? So see how I have only used F8, only used F8 on the part that you are going to read. Do not use F8 on the entire citation. Only use it on the part you're going to read because otherwise, like let's say this entire thing used the F8 function. It's kind of easy still because it's at the front, but one, doesn't that just look like butt fugly? And two, <laughs> two, yeah, this is really a lecture on aesthetics, y'all. Um, two, it's harder to find the part that you actually need to read. If you were presented with this like wall of thing while you're trying to read through documents quickly in a debate, you would be like, Sputnik 19, I guess, but should I also just read this entire part about who Paul Wong is? It's like, no, okay? So only use the F8 on the relevant part of the citation. Okay, last function in verbatim that I want to show you <coughs> is the clear function. This is useful whenever you have made a whoopsies. You made a mistake, you want to undo your mistake. So for example, let's say that I like cut this card originally and it's like we went to a tournament and it's like I realized like because I read this card like seven times in my 1AC or whatever that like wow this card is like awfully highlighted. Like wow, Ezra really over highlighted this card. We really just need to go back to the drawing board on this card. Grimsley is like yeah, Ezra, Ezra screwed up this card. Grimsley is completely right. Ezra didn't actually try very hard to cut this card. 
But what I would do is that I would highlight the entire part, and then I would hit the F12 clear key. See how I got rid of all the underlining and emphasis? And then to get rid of the highlighting, I would have to go here and hit no color. And now we get to recut our card from scratch. Sometimes in debate, you like realize that you cut a card wrong initially and you want to change some part of it. You like accidentally underline something as you're going that you're like, wow, did I not want to underline that or whatever. The F12 key is basically your go-to undo key. It's very useful. Does anyone have any questions about what any of the function keys do? Why we use function keys and not other uh, word functions that exist? And any questions relating to function keys, flipping your function keys, etc. Okay, I want to give you a demonstration of how to use a speech document. A speech document in verbatim is like a term of art, and I will show you how to create a speech document. So let's say I want to create a new verbatim document. You know how it's like you have files that you were given? Like see on this lovely uh, flash drive that I was lent? Um, that there are like multiple files. And it's like on your Dropbox there are multiple files, in the starter pack there are multiple files. Each one of these is its own verbatim document that is created by hitting the new button in the debate like ribbon thing that appears at the top of your screen. So hit new. We are going to do, for demonstration purposes, some of you gave this speech last night, so apologies to all of you for the fact that I'm about to put together a really bad speech document for demonstration purposes. But we are about to give a practice one in R on the politics to set. Usually what I actually label mine is I label in the F4 header the speech and the round, so I would be like, one in R, um, SDI camp tournament, round one. Then I go down and I create an F5 header that is like politics. The reason I do it this way is that while in this speech we're only going to like take one argument, let's say I'm giving a 2 and C on like the counter plan and T and like several case arguments. I would have counter plan, and that would be an F5 header, and then T would be its own F5 header, and then like CCP advantage would be an F5 header. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. <coughs> then I'm also going to open the um, politics setup. And we are going to go to the SDI page, and we are going to download politics to set, because Ezra forgot to include it. Okay, so now we have our neg politics TA file and our practice speech, which is basically our opponent's 2AC, and we have a document that is our document. So I go here and I'm going to select choose document. I am going to choose one of these documents to make my speech document. You can only have one speech document open at a time for a reason that will become clear in a second. So document two is this document, so I'm going to select document two and I'm going to select choose document. Now, how many of you have ever been preparing a speech and have been like, the most annoying and time-wasting thing <coughs> in the world is that let's say that I needed my uniqueness cards out of my politics DA file. I have to like go to the politics DA file, and I have to like go find will pass, and then I have to like do this. I have to like scroll using the mouse. Wow, I just wasted like 15 seconds of my valuable prep time. I have to hit control C, and then I have to hit control B. And then it like appears there, and wow, wasn't that a waste of time? How many of you are like, wow, this is a waste of time? And I only have eight minutes of prep time, and life is hard. Okay. <laughs> Fortunately, Verbatim has a tool designed to make your life infinitely easier. Now that we have this labeled as our speech document, if I go over to my politics DA, and I select text that is in the F6 header, and I hit right beneath the escape key in the upper left hand corner, you will see something labeled tilde. It is this, um, it is this symbol. Yes? I 
I hit that key. Now let us go over to our speech document. Without going in between the documents, with only having my politics DA open, I have somehow sent over the block that says will pass without going through and copying and pasting it all. I'm seeing confused faces, so I'm going to like explain it again. Hopefully that provides a little bit of clarity. After I have marked this thing as my speech document, which I do by going to choose document, I select one document that is my speech document. This is the document I am about to get my 2 NC out of. I hit choose document. I then go to where in the document I want my block to occur. I then go to the file, right? You have files that like contain basically all of your cards and then you put them into speech documents where you like read out. So I go to my speech shop. Or sorry, I go to my politics gate. And I hit will pass. And I go to the will pass header, and right underneath the escape key in the upper left hand corner of my keyboard, there is a tilde key. It looks like, dang it, I wish there were markers. Um, it has a little, like a squiggle, slash, a, it has a squiggle, and, not slash, because slash is a different key, and I realize that I can't say that out loud without confusing you all. There's a squiggle. And then there is also like a little tick mark, yes, on one key. I hit that key. And you will see that that will transfer over into my speech document, which I have now done three times. It will transfer over the block that I want to read. Whose mind is blown? OK. Who is going to save like two minutes of 2 and C prep? Now? OK. I am glad. Thank you all very much. Can you Sure, I am happy to explain it again. I am going to see if I can come up with a different. Am I like blowing your mind too? Yes. Okay. Fun fact this is hard. Subi is great at debate and went to the national debate tournament and is having her mind blown right now. Um, speech document. Select document as speech document. I have file. My file is like my AF file or my politics DA file. I go to the politics DA file. I go to the document header of the block that I want. I hit tilde. Magic. OK. You click choose document. Yes, and then you click choose document. And then it's like if I wanted to change it, I could. Does that make sense to everybody who, OK. Now also, let's say that I like accidentally tilde over will pass three times. Because in this case, I have tilde over will pass three times. And there is no reason why I need to do that, because the three blocks are exactly identical. And therefore, having them reproduce just makes my document too large, and that's annoying to everyone, including me while I'm giving my speech. Yes? So there is a nice set of keyboard functions that allow for you to delete an entire header. So put your cursor in the document, in the block header, then click Alt, which is right next to Control in the bottom left hand corner, and then hit the side arrow, the like left arrow. Alt, that nah, wrong key. Alt left arrow, see how it highlights the entire block? And then it just like went away. See how there are only two in my document pane now? I'm gonna do it again. So like, let's say you accidentally tilde over something that you like don't want and you don't care about. You can just get rid of it without needing to go through and highlight the entire thing. Mind blown? Yes? Galaxy brain? OK. Now let's make our little practice speech. We are not going to like tinker with this perfectly, but we are going to like pull over the blocks. Obviously, giving a good speech is a question of like modifying your blocks to specific circumstances and like making them responsive to the other team's argument. We are just going to get all of the blocks that we would need to give this politics DA one and R into our speech chat. So the first argument that the two AC made was yes, we will default, which is a non-unique argument against the disat. So conveniently, Ezra has already pulled our will pass block into our speech document. Isn't that guy smart? The next argument is no link because Trump is like doesn't like experience any pain or anything. I don't really understand. No link because Trump has no policy and therefore things don't affect him. So if we go over to, I'm just going to close out this document because it's now useless. We go over to our speech document. 
Then we go over to our debt ceiling document. We go to the link section. We go to A2 no link Teflon Trump. We hit the tilde key. Then we go to our politics setup. The third argument is PC fails. We go back to our politics to set. We go to PC true. We tilde that over. We now have our cards the PC works in the document. Notice how I am doing all of this without ever actually looking at the document. Like you can look at the document right as you're about to give the speech, but we are going to put all the cards in the document without ever actually looking at the document. PC theory wrong, that is functionally answered by the previous set of cards. Oh wait, no it's not. We have different cards on that. Kind of. We'll just throw over all these cards, we can figure out which one we actually have. <coughs> Economic decline doesn't cause war, I go to the beautiful impact section of my file. A2 no war, pull those cards. And then we have some impact turn about Trump impeachment. And we pull that one. Okay, who is ready to look at our speech document and how beautiful it looks? We're all ready? Okay. See how all of the cards are now in the document in order? Mind blown. Okay. Now another pro tip. Let's say that you like are going through and it's like coincidentally, you are like, what's your name? Okay, Shannon, you are clearly very excited and I'm very happy about that. Um, Sorry to like call you out, but you look so excited. Um, let's say that we tilted things over in the wrong order. Like it's like we knew that like 2AC number 4 was no link, but it's like we saw the link section of our file before the impact section of the file, so we like put a link argument in the wrong place, and we need to like reorder things on our navigation, right? That happens sometimes. There is a convenient drag and drop feature that is included with our navigation paint. We can just go like so and so, like let's say the no link Teflon Trump argument was coincidentally at the bottom of the flow. I could use drag and drop to move it in my document name. Or like let's say midway through the speech, I like this is really a two and C and I'm also taking like the CCP advantage or whatever. And it's like I decided for whatever reason I wanted to do the CCP advantage first. I could move that. And then let's say that there were like a bunch of F6 headers under the CCP advantage, like CCP advantage, no war, 2 and C, and CCP advantage. Wow, I can't type. No war, A2 interdependence. If I try to move the F5 header, it will also move all of the F6 headers and cards that are underneath. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. <clears throat> Let me see if there are any other functions that I wanted to demonstrate for you here. Okay. Um, how many of you still debate in places where you need to use flash drives? We are going to demo both flash drives and email chains here in a second. First we will demonstrate flash drives. Verbatim has a convenient function to make it more efficient for you to use a flash drive. Which is especially helpful because I'm sure a lot of you have had judges before that are like prep stops when the flash drive comes out, and you're like, wow, I just wasted like 45 seconds of prep like fiddling with my flash drive. And also because this tournament is weird, I only get like four minutes of prep anyways, and then I'm just like crying because I spent 45 seconds of my four minutes of prep fiddling with my flash drive. And wow, isn't life terrible? Okay. I'm going to make your life less terrible. You all know how control plus S is save. Like that is like normal save it up. Verbatim has a beautiful inbuilt feature called Save to USB. If there's only one USB drive to plug into your computer, which I have a USB drive plugged in right now, and you hit Control Shift S instead of just Control S, I hit Control Shift S, and we are going to label this one in our SCI Camp Tournament Round One. You're going to hit Save. It is successfully copied to the USB without me like tracking down where the USB is on the computer. And then, beautifully, right here on my document is, or on my USB is this document with me being able to save this in like five seconds instead of like 45 seconds. And then you can just like pull it out, hand it to the other team, and you are not wasting copious amounts of prep, 
and you are getting a strategic advantage because your opponents are wasting a copious amount of prep. When your annoying judge is like flashing his prep, your opponents are sitting there fighting their computers and they're like, oh, how do I flash drive efficiently? And you're like, three seconds. We're good. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you feel so powerful? Okay. I'm glad that you all feel powerful. I feel powerful. The next thing I want to show you all is email chain etiquette. Email chains are a more uh, modern way of doing this whole uh, debate thing. I want to show you all how to correctly set up and use an email chain. The first thing is that whenever you save a document, you should save it to a place where you will know where it is. That way you can attach it successfully. While in the modern era, not a lot of judges are taking prep for emailing, one, some still are, and two, if you take copious amounts of time to email documents, judges should get annoyed with you because we like people who are organized and we don't like people who waste our time, basically. And you are wasting our time if you are taking like three minutes to email something. So here is how one effectively uses an email. <coughs> we are going to my fake email. We are going to send an email to me. And who else is going to be in this debate? <laughs> We're going to email Grimsley too because I'm in a grumpy mood. Okay. Apparently Ezra and Grimsley are debating each other. We are going to title our email chain. It is the SDI Camp Tournament Round 1. Right? So start by titling the email chain with the tournament and round. Please. Please do that. Do not send email chains without titles. It pisses your judges off. It is annoying. They cannot find things later. You cannot find things later. It shows that you are disorganized and lazy. Judges do not like debaters who are disorganized and lazy. Please do not be disorganized and lazy. It takes you five seconds to title an email chain. On the app, we have Ezra. And on the negative, we have the Grimsley. SDI Camp Tournament Round 1, Ezra versus Grimsley. And for whatever reason, we are starting this debate in the 1&R. So I go to where I know that I saved my politics, yay. 1&R SDI Camp Tournament Round 1. I attach it using the attach function, and then I hit send. And now, Grimsley and I should get an email from my fake account with this document. Grimsley, did you get your email? Not yet. Oh, dang it. Okay, another note while we're on this. <coughs> Gmail introduced that whole, like, Grimsley got the document, yay! Okay. Gmail introduced this, like, 10 second delay function. If you are actively debating, I recommend you do not use it because you will just annoy your judges and opponents and your partner. Because then it will take, you will, like, hit send on the email and you will be like, all right, it's going to pull up everyone. And then it's like everyone will sit there for 30 seconds while the like auto delay is going. And then it's just like, it's annoying. It's like, I sent the document, but my computer has the auto delay thing and it's gonna take us another 30 seconds. So let's all sit here awkwardly while my auto delay works. If you are actively debating, I highly, highly recommend that you turn that, you turn that off. Yes? What is auto delay for not in debate? Uh, basically it's like, let's say I'm sending a log professional email to like an actual person. And it's like I hit send and then I'm like, oh dang, I have a typo, that's embarrassing. So basically if you, a lot of people now have debate specific emails, I don't, but like a lot of people do. So if you have a debate specific email, there's no reason to have it on. And then it's like, think about the number of actual professional emails that you all send. Probably very, very little. Even for me it is very, very little and I'm guessing that my quantity is like four times y'all's. And I'm guessing that for y'all it's like I send like one professional email a month, if that. So it's like, really, do you need this feature? Like, no, you do not. Actual adults need this feature? We are not actual adults. Yeah? Okay. We all agree. How do you disable it? How do you disable it? I do not know the answer to that question. I believe it is not enabled by default. So if you have not enabled it, you should just like not do anything. If you have enabled it, then you know how to enable it, which means you also know how to disable it, which means you should go do that. <laughs> Okay, I want to talk for a brief second about updating the wiki. Uh, in debate, there is a norm called the wiki. Uh, it is not a rule that you update the wiki, however, it is a norm. 
Um, and it is an important part of sharing intelligence. It allows your opponents to prep more effectively. And by opting into a system where you post your arguments on the wiki, you create a culture where your opponents also post arguments on the wiki. However, some people are like, updating the wiki is annoying because I don't know how to do it, basically. Yeah, okay. So it's like, that's Okay. So, there is a convenient verbatim feature for updating the wiki. If I go to my document, let's say this is the document of all the cards I read in the debate, for the sake of argument. When you do this, you should make a Word document that has all of the cards you read in the debate. So in reality, this would not just contain the 1 in R, it would also contain like my 1 in C and my 2 in C and my 1 in R and any 2 in R cards. Then I go to Citify, wait, no, I go to Wikify. I hit Save. I hit Wikify. And it is about to go through, it's going to take like 15 seconds, and it is going to make the document of code that I can then upload to the wiki. I wanted to show you all this, I'm not going to walk you all step by step through to how to update the wiki, because uh, that's a more complicated process than I really want to demonstrate right now. But I wanted to show you the inbuilt verbatim feature to get your document into the format you need to update the wiki. Does that make sense to everyone? You go to document, you go to the ribbon at the top, you hit Wikify, magic happens. We all smile, because it's beautiful. Okay. One thing that I will recommend is that there are a couple of functions on verbatim that use like copious amounts of your computer's brain power, basically, um, and can sometimes crash your computer. Wikify is one of them. I would make sure that any document that you care about is already saved, and that the document that you are attempting to Wikify is saved, just in case it collapses your word. It usually won't, but sometimes it will. That and the stats function are things that like sometimes they just like your word just like goes bananas, it like does not work. So you have to make sure that everything is safe and also that it's like if your computer got stuck on a two minute loop, um, this would not be a horrible, horrible moment for that to happen. It's obviously never ideal for your computer to just stop working for two minutes, but it's like make sure that like if your computer did stop working for two minutes, it wouldn't like destroy your life basically. Okay, last thing I want to talk about before I take some questions is I want to talk about computer setup optimization for Windows specifically. This is our few tips and tricks from Ezra. They are not required for anyone, but I think that they may help you. The first is sidebar optimization. So you see this thing at the bottom? This is the toolbar. You right click it and you go to taskbar settings. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to unlock the taskbar. Then I'm going to move the taskbar to the side. And the reason I'm doing this is about to become clear. Whenever you have multiple Word documents open, which you almost always do during a debate, you have like your 1 in C and their 1 AC and the 2 AC and you have like six speech documents open and then also you have like four of your own files open because you like need like impact defense and you need like our 2 AC blocks and you need like our 1 AR blocks or whatever, right? You have like so many documents open. It's annoying. So you want it on the side. Turn on use small taskbar buttons, and then scroll down, combine taskbar buttons, and hit there. And you see how now, and I actually like to extend this to make, sure, so make it so I can see more. You see how now you can see the title of every document. Before, you remember how the taskbar was at the bottom, and it was like in those single buttons, and it was like in order to find a given Word document, I would have to like hover over Word, and then I would have to like figure out which one I wanted, and all of that is like a process that takes time and is annoying, basically. If you set your taskbar like this, you will be able to see the title of every document you have open, which means that I could easily be like, oh, I'm here prepping my 2AC. I need to go find my app file. Boom, I have located my app file. Yes? Yeah, of course. OK. First, go to. Sorry, I'm just resetting it so I can show it from the beginning. Okay, see this taskbar and how annoying it is? I go, I can, I right click the taskbar. So like your mouse has two buttons, right? Right click the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. Hit taskbar settings, which is this thing. Unlock the taskbar, hit off so that you can move it. <coughs> then use your cursor to manually move it to the side of the screen. Then, 
click on for use small taskbar buttons, and then combine taskbar buttons never. Unlock the taskbar, move it to the other side, on use small taskbar buttons, and never combine taskbar buttons. Does that make sense to everyone? Question. Yes, go for it. What's the advantage of having the taskbar on the side as opposed to the bottom? Uh, perfect question. Let's move it back to the bottom just so we can see. <clears throat> the reason is that fewer things will fit. So, for example, you can see here that I only have like five documents open, which in the grand scheme of the number of documents you need open in a debate is like pretty small. Um, and that is the like maximum width of my task bar. In an actual debate, I would say that I at least on average probably have like 10 to 15 documents open. Because I have like a bunch of speech documents, a bunch of my own files. Like I like randomly need like X piece of garbage from like some back file. And I am like... I have everything open. I'm a mess. I need to be able to see my mess, and if it is on the bottom, then I can't see it as effectively. Great question. Uh, any other questions? Okay, awesome. There are a two things that I want to show you in the resource packet, and then I will very briefly open up for questions. The first is the search everything tool. If you click this link, it will open up a tool that you can use to make it so that it will search the names of every document that you have on your computer. So it will search just the title. So for example, one like thing that a lot of people have is that they are like really slow at navigating through the subfolder like sections of their Dropbox. It is a PC only tool that you can download. It's like small, it will not give you a virus, although your computer will tell you it will give you a virus. And you can set it to where there is like an automatic execute, like hotkey. And then you can like search the file name. Like let's say that I know that like somewhere there is something labeled like politics DA from GSU. And it's like for whatever reason I need a card from that file, even though it was like a year ago. I can like open that file quickly without needing to delve into my subfoldering. I can open it from there. It's a lot easier and it helps people who like remember documents by what they're titled, but not by where they're located. I recommend avoiding being dependent on this because it gets a little bit frustrating and you need to be able to adapt to both. So don't like become dependent on this tool, but a lot of people find this tool incredibly helpful. Last thing I want to talk about are browser extensions. There are three that I recommend that I think are very debate specific and very useful. You can use them on either Chrome or Firefox which are the only two browsers that you should ever really use for debate. Microsoft Edge slash Explorer is like, no. Chrome is like probably better than Firefox, but is like a polluted and like corporate piece of garbage basically. And Firefox is like what the hipsters who care about their privacy use. So if you are one of those people, use Firefox. If you are not one of those people, you can continue using your polluted piece of garbage called Google Chrome. <laughs> I would recommend against using Internet Explorer. Oh my God, it's so good. Interesting take. <laughs> yes, what's your question? What about Tor? Okay, I would rec like I would recommend against Okay. I recommend against using Tor in debates because it's ridiculously slow because it's constantly trying to rewrite you through the network. If you value I'm sure you already know the distinction here, but if you value your privacy, I would recommend acquiring a VPN and using that at tournaments. That's what I do. Um, Using Tor is just far slower than using VPN. Yes? Wait, what's wrong with Chrome? Okay, we're not getting into it. Um, anyway, there are three browser extensions that I recommend. The first is the Site Creator browser extension, which I have not actually used. It is a debate specific tool. You can use it to make it so that whenever you pull up a given page, it will try to automatically piece together your citation based on like finding the author or finding the title of the article. You can like input what your template is for how you like your citation to look. Uh, you can install it. It's like a small, like very clean thing. It appears in the bottom right-hand corner of most articles. And you just set it up. The next one is OneTab. What OneTab does is that, let's say that I am in the middle of a research session. I have like 15 tabs open. And I want to be able to find my 15 tabs later. What I can do is I can hit the OneTab button, and it will collapse all those tabs. 
I can like close out of my computer, I can go get dinner, I can like have less crap open. But once I hit one tab, I can then go to the one tab page later and there will be a button for me to reload all those tabs. So it's an incredibly useful research tool, especially given that like whenever we're doing research, we do it in like multiple chunks because otherwise we'd go crazy. Because uh, you can't do a file in like a reasonable amount of time for you to sit there and do it all at once. If you have not figured that out yet, you're going to figure it out from experience and it's going to be rough. Um, so I just recommend taking my word for it. Um, and one tab is helpful for allowing you to have access to all of those tabs later on. The third one is stay focused. This is for those of you who are undisciplined and in the presence of a computer become distracted easily and don't do your work. Stay focused includes a variety of just like productivity tools. For example, you can like cut off your ability to access websites that you know are distracting. So for example, you could be like block Facebook, block snaker.io, block I don't know what the odds, block Tetris, block whatever it is that y'all play with. Yeah, sure, whatever someone else just said. Block Twitter, block Reddit, etc. Block whatever distracts you on the internet, and you can like set a timer and be like, I am going to work and cut cards for an hour. You can like set a timer and it will not let you access those websites for an hour. And then like you can be productive, and then at the end of that hour, you can like reward yourself with like a 20 minute break. And it's awesome, and that is an infinitely better system than like, wow, I am a complete and total mess, and I have really cut no cards in my hour and a half session because I am like constantly alternating between Facebook and Gchat and like all the other things. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions. Open questions about anything that is generalizable to the entire group about anything that I have said. Anything that anyone wants demonstrated again. Yes, in the front row. Do you use like those side plus four, like what you do today? Yes. I have mine as a side taskbar at basically all times. <coughs> oh, and then another thing about the side taskbar. Sorry, one second, let me move it again. There are basically two things that I pin to my taskbar. What it means to pin something to your taskbar is that that, doc, that application will always appear even if it is not open. So for example, it's like things that don't need to be pinned to my taskbar are like Microsoft Excel. Like I use it sometimes but so rarely that it's like I don't need to be able to access it instantly. The two things that need to be able to be accessed instantly are your web browser and the document explorer and arguably Microsoft Word. Although I usually just have Word documents open because I'm alternating between debate and whatever else I'm doing pretty much constantly. But some people would like pin up Microsoft Word as well. So when you right click on a given thing, like this one right now stands for the Windows Explorer, it is pinned to the taskbar, which means that even if I like close out of this window, you will see that there is still a way for me to reopen the Windows Firewall Explorer from my taskbar, which means I can do it more effectively and I don't have to do this crazy thing where I like hit the Windows key and then I search like File Explorer, and then I like do that. That's slow and annoying. Just clicking this button, wow, wasn't that easy. Saves like three seconds. Seconds matter, y'all. I also pin my web browser, which is also orange. But it's like, let's say I like, I'm not going to because I need this for the next lecture, but let's say I closed out of all of this, it would still be available for me. Great question. Does anyone have any other questions? Is that a hand or is that a stretch? That is a stretch. Yes? Uh, so you have to click on the taskbar. Like, so you left click on the taskbar, and then you keep clicking and you drag. And then there's this annoying thing that it does sometimes, where it's like if you click on a icon of a thing that is an application, it like won't drag correctly, and you have to like move your cursor in order to find a spot on the taskbar that isn't for an application. Look, this is just how computers work, y'all. They're annoying. Yes? What is underlying mode? Is it underlying mode? Oh, okay, underlying mode. Okay, there is a distinction between underlying mode and auto underline. Never use auto underline. Remember that part of the lecture? Never use auto underline? Okay. 
underlying mode is that after I click this, instead of needing to hit the F9 key after I highlight words every time, it will just automatically underline words if I highlight them with my cursor. So for example, this isn't actually a card, but let's say I was going to highlight it and I wanted to highlight recent speeches proved. I could just do this. I personally don't use it because as you can see, it's not working very well right now. And on some computers, it like does a weird thing where it like, <coughs> highlights one like letter at a time. Um, so I don't use it because it does that on my computer, but for some people it really works. Yes? Um, for like the control F2, F3, F4, you want to like just click F2 instead That is that you need to do the toggle lock thing that I talked about earlier. Either there is an option on your keyboard to do it by hitting FN plus escape, or you are going to have to go through and change it in the BIOS settings or whatever they're called, which is like something that's very central to your computer, and in order to change it, you're going to have to like full reboot your computer. So in the resource pack that I uploaded, there's a guide to how to do it. You can find other guides on the internet just by Googling. I recommend like setting aside half an hour to deal with that later, basically. Okay. But it is like it is well worth your time to take 30 to 45 minutes to fix that. Okay. For I'm sure you're aware. You sound annoyed about it. Oh. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? All right. Thank you all very much uh, for attending. Uh, we're going to take a quick break at 10:30. Be in Bruce's room next door to learn research.